Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to Wednesday's Live. Um, I wanted to talk today about something that, uh, planning, of course, how do you plan? Hi, Kathy. Uh, planning of a watercolor, but I also wanted to explain a little bit about this uh, business of uh, the condition of the paper and the consistency of the paint. Hello, Kevin. So what I've done a few minutes ago, I've divided the paper into four sections. I painted on this, the sheen has gone off, the water is soaked in. This one still has a bit of water on the top and some is soaked in, I'm gonna refresh it. And then this one, I'm gonna put the uh, water on the top of it right now. Hi, Carol. So hopefully this will be helpful to you. Um, I'm just putting plain water on the paper. It's a piece of 140 pound uh, Saunders Rough turned over on its backside. So it's somewhere between cold press and rough. And this, of course, I'm just gonna leave dry. So if I take paint, runny paint, let's get some yellow ochre. Runny paint, when I tip it, Let's put a lot of water in there. Tip it and it runs. If I put that on where there's still water on the top, you can see it gets a lot lighter and it spreads out quite a bit. Now where some of it's still on the top and some of it's soaked in, it's not gonna move quite as easily, but it's still gonna disperse. Over here, it's been dry for a few minutes. That's, well, that's still moving a little bit. Now, what happens if we put stiffer, slow moving paint? like this ultramarine blue, when I tip it, it doesn't move. Um, you can see it stays put. This is the, uh, the water has soaked in. It's below the surface. Uh, the edge is gonna kinda get soft, but it's gonna be very distinct. Here, less so. The edge will be even less distinct, and you'll notice it's a little bit lighter because there's more water there. And here, it's probably gonna spread out the most and be the lightest. And of course, if we do it on a dry section, it stays pretty much exactly the way you put it. And here, let's try some of our yellow ochre. Again, that pale mix, it just stays exactly the way you did it. So you can see here, this is very indistinct, somewhat more distinct, a bit more distinct in, in all these cases. And of course, the most distinct is on the dry. So hopefully that will help illustrate what's going on there. Because what's going on is um, on dry paper, you put the, 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 whether it's runny or whether it's slow moving, it's got no place to swim other than where it, within itself. So it just stays put. Here we've got more water on top so the pigment can swim. And it gets lighter because that water on there is gonna uh, disperse the pigment. Um, some on the top, some soaked in, a little less distinct. Uh, completely soaked in, a bit more distinct. So here, uh, you know, <laughs> that probably looks about the same to you. Uh, it did travel a bit farther here because it had more water on the top, a little less farther here. Um, it's a very relative thing from one paper to another, from one weight to another, you'll notice a difference. But generally, uh, the more glisten you see 
on the top of the paper, the more water is on the paper. So the, here the glisten has gone off. It may look dry, it may even feel dry, but if you touch it, it's still cool. Um, here you'll see a little bit of a glisten. Here you'll see a lot of glisten. Here, of course, no glisten. So hopefully that gives you a few clues because we're going to use that a good bit today. So I've got this nice uh, uh, view of the Cascade Range, um, Mount Hood in front, followed by Mount St. Helens, Mount Adams, and way in the back there, Mount Rainier. It's just barely visible. And the draw on this is pretty simple. Um, I'm gonna look for my key horizontals and my key verticals. So, oh, I think I'm gonna go a little bit above the halfway mark for that horizon. I'm not gonna draw it too dark uh, because I want it to <laughs> disappear in the back. Uh, about at the quarter mark is where we're gonna locate the peak of Mount Hood. And it's basically a triangle which is a little steeper on its right and a little shallower on its left. Comes to about there. Extends all the way to the right there. Now I'm just gonna go basically triangle and then I'm gonna articulate it a bit more. This will help me find, if I look at the bit above the horizon there, it's a little bit bigger than what we see of Mount St. Helens there. And it's more or less an equilateral triangle, but we can play with that a little bit. Uh, Adam's a little bit shallower. I'm just gonna kind of indicate him. Rainier, I'm going to, <laughs> I'm gonna paint that in. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it as indistinct as I possibly can. So let's make Mount Hood look a little more articulate. So there's a, within this, there's a different angle there. There's a little jog out here. Um, Some of these mountains are have very, very uh, distinctive silhouettes, something like the Matterhorn maybe. But most of these you can be pretty generalized with. Now, okay, so I'm gonna call that a little bit of a jog up here. Uh, slight curvature there. Now I'm gonna call this my basic silhouette. And the thing I'm going to do now is I'm going to look for the planes or the facets within this. So there's a kind of a ridge that creates a facet coming down here and here almost makes kind of a curve there. And there's a facet within here. So I'm generally going to indicate those for my, and then there's a one that's a kind of a flat plane here, followed by a little bit of a jog. Hi, Catherine. So, you can make plenty of noise, that's all right. <laughs> so I'm gonna have basically one, two, three, four planes here. One, two, three, four. And the bits where there's mountains showing and the bits where there's snow covering it, don't feel you have to get that with ridiculously surgical accuracy. They, uh, as we speak, they're getting more snow. 
So you can put as much snow on there as you like. So, so we got some a lot of freedom here on this. These I would kind of like these uh, distant lower peaks. I think I would like to kind of paint in. Now I'll just erase maybe some of the construction lines so they don't show the horizontal and the vertical. So the planning of a watercolor, you always think in terms of generally going from, hi Karen, um, light to dark, big to small, and wetter to, to drier surfaces, and less distinct marks, softer edges, going towards very specific crisp edges. So I'm going to do something like I did here, where the water is still on top, with the, there's a gradation in the blue there to a kind of a creamier color, and then we're gonna stop at our whites. I'm gonna bring yellow ochre down through there water on top. Then I'm gonna bring, I'll probably even down through here, and then I'm gonna bring blue on top of that. So I'll be somewhere between these two stages. And the blue will soften and lighten as it goes down. We hope. <laughs> gonna use a pretty big brush, A I, this is like I think the 14, or if it was a French, it would be a size four. Uh, and then probably from there, I'll go to a smaller brush like this uh, Oriental, which would be roughly equivalent to a number six. The idea here is this holds a lot of paint for the wash. This doesn't hold much paint and will give me a little more control and a little more texture. So, make a big puddle of yellow ochre. I might even put a little, little smidge of our brighter yellow into it to get, make it sunny. And make lots. I'm always guilty of not making enough. I want it runny. And Big puddle. What the heck? We'll use it later. All right. Coming across the top there, creating a bead, picking up the bead. What I'm creating here is the situation where most of the water is on top. I'm gonna skip my Mount Hood there. If you get a little too much on Mount St. Helens, Adams, or Rainier, that's okay. You can lift them out late, uh, at this stage. Let's let that just come down here, like so. Now, rinse that good. Get all the yellow out of there. Sheesh, it migrates. Now I'm gonna go for my, oh, ultramarine blue or cobalt or cerulean, it doesn't matter. This I want somewhat runny, but not as runny as what I used on the uh, yellow ochre. Coming in from the top, I'm gonna load from the top and let it run down. I'm at about a 45 degree angle here. I may tip this. Oh, John, you didn't make enough. Loading from the top, letting it run. I'm gonna tip it. See if I can get it to go down faster. 
I might put a little water in that and coax it. We're at the holy mess stage. Now it's getting down here. I'm just barely touching that paper. Very, very lightly. Now as it's getting down here, I am going to tip us back up to our normal angle and just let that work. And I'm gonna take this blue that I've got left over and I'm just gonna put it down here where it's going to be blue anyway, or darker. So you can always underpaint an area that's darker. We could even start in on some of our areas like that. And again, these shapes, like I say, they're yours to play with because snowfall from one week or year to the next. Says, how do you keep the yellow and blue from going green? Ah, okay, so I am not stirring them together. I'm letting the water do the work. Um, that's why I tipped it. Uh, I was initially at stage, let's see. Let's see if we can make, I'm just gonna touch this a bit. So what happens, oops, <laughs> we do have earthquakes in this area. Okay, imagine if all these went off at once. Holy crow, um, wouldn't want to live in the Midwest. So I wouldn't want to live under that. Um, because there's water on top, when I apply more water and i.e., the blue paint. Um, it is running through the existing water and it's swimming. Um, and brown, something called Brownian motion keeps the particles separated. Now, as there is less water on the top and it can't move as easily, and if there's no water on top and it just, the only water that's on there is what you're bringing to it with the paint, if you get in there and keep stirring, you're gonna be pushing those particles of color together and they're going to look like, uh, you're gonna get a green. Um, it is, if I can see, it's a little bit green, but so is this. It's that color you get at the horizon. So the idea is to keep a lot of water on the surface so that you, uh, The, give the pigment some place to swim. And it's worth trying, you know, I mean, get a sheet of, uh, on the back of a painting that's not going so good or uh, whatever, and uh, wet the paper to those four different consistencies and just try different consist four different conditions and try those different consistencies of paint on top to see what you get. So here I'm gonna get into a little stiffer blue. Uh, and I'm also going to put a wee bit of a red into it to get a my ballpoint pen purple. Um, I'm gonna make a lot of that. So I'll throw a little bit of the yellow ochre into it too to dirty it up. Now here, I want to leave the white areas. Um, I'm going to, if you notice there's those ravines and I, it looks like bare granite or whatever, uh, but there's some deep ravines where they're slightly darker. I'm going to paint the lighter color in 
which will create one of these two situations here. And then when it, the glisten is going off or about to go off, I'm going to come in with the darker colors with stiffer paint. In other words, more pigment, less water. And I'm going to try and create some of these ridges. So what I'm looking for here is the color of the bare granite. Um, I'll leave myself some white, uh, mindful of the Okay, so a little bit more of the red and the yellow in it, a little bit less of the blue, just so that I get some variation of color from front to back. Uh, let's try to create some non-geometric shapes. Slightly more organic. Um... Uh, back here. Now, this area back here, that's a little bit wetter. So, see it spreading out? As I get down here, it's drier. Now, as I get way down here, Now, I'm waiting for this to get its sheen to go off, and it has not done that yet. So I'm going to take some, rinse that out, blot it, take some greener blue, put a little turquoise or a little cerulean, uh, again, slow moving, and I'm going to go back here. Where this occurs. Now that's wetter because we had two applications. And that surface is still fairly somewhere between the water is on the top. Now I'm going to take just a damp brush and I'm going to tease some of that blue up into the mountain ranges there. We can later still lift out if we want. I'm going to put it a little darker as I get down here to the bottom, closer to Mount Hood. Uh, you can see a gradation from very pale to darker to yet darker. and it almost kind of merges into this area. Now that area I just painted. So you see when I put that mark in there, it boy, it just disappeared in there. Might even create some blossoms. But that's okay because we do have texture here. Now back to my greener blue, put a little yellow ochre in it. Um, Way distant here, Eastern Oregon. You can get in there with some darks later. Now, Sheen is going off right about here. Hi, Cindy. Um, maybe I'll get the littler brush now. So I'm going to get the stiffer ultramarine blue, slower, you know, slow moving, a little bit of red in it to create a purple, rich purple, blue violet kind of color. And I'm going to start, oh, see that's still wet because I just painted there. I'm going to try to get some of these uh, ravines with soft edges. 
There's a big one coming down. Like so. See how that shape is more or less maintaining itself, but the edges are softening. This is uh, the other way I've talked about this is the uh, whip, hot cocoa and the whipped cream or milk. And if you haven't heard that before, it's if you have a cup of hot cocoa, it's it's liquid, and if you pour milk into it, it will disperse and get lighter which is kind of what happens here where there's a lot of water on top and it disperses easily. If you were to put something thicker like whip topping on it, then it will melt around the edges, but it will maintain its form a little better. So today's a good day for hot cocoa. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah, coffee will do too. So I'm going to take a little bit of where it's wetter here. Now see, this surface is wetter than uh, that surface. Sheen is still on here. Sheen is off there. So it's really going to get soft, and I'm going to hopefully create some of those little, let's get a greener blue but slow moving. To get those indistinct, distant. Would you call them hills? I don't know, because they're not mountains. So I better get real busy here. Um, let's say I, I waited too long and I'm getting too sharp a mark. Then I could bring a bit of water to it, the edge that I want soft. So if my light is coming in from the left, I want to soften the right. Um, it's always good to scope out where your light source is originating from. Squint and see what I'm creating here. Say I want to soften this edge, maybe. I'll put a little water there. Uh, put a little water there. Now, let's see, mix up more of that. Uh, let's get a big one going over here. Soften the right, leave the left hard. Uh, I think I can get into, well, I have to be careful because that's there's, there's still a sheen here, uh, not here. So I probably could do some of these little marks. I'm going to put a little bit more red or maybe even just a touch of burnt sienna in that. Um, and I'll do these more distinct. Type marks. What's that? Oh, we got a UFO. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've given to understand this is an active area for that sort of thing, so. And of course. Tune into Alex Jones for the real poop on that. <laughs> Don't tune into Alex Jones, please. I don't even know him, so it's okay. <laughs> yeah, he's going to jail. Oh. <laughs> so, pre pretty soon, we hope. Hey, this is terrible. I, sh I shouldn't be editorializing on Facebook here. Well. So. Hi, Ross. Okay, so. 
Now, yeah, I can. The thing I'm doing is I'm making the mark a little darker and more distinct on the right sides and softening them as desired on the left side. No, on the, softening them on the right side, making them distinct on the left side. That's it. Okay. I'm guilty of dyslexia, so a lot of artists are. Nothing to... I never noticed it about you. I can assure you I have trouble with it. Okay, now I'm going to put a little bit of this in here, carefully being careful not to get next to those very dark areas there. Now, within this, there's going to be some glazing later. Within this, the white side shouldn't be, if this is a little later in the day, we would see a more distinct. Um, oh, hi, Charles. Uh, we would see a bit more distinct uh, difference between the character of the whites there. Uh, I'm going to let this dry a bit or get to a drier stage and work up here because that's the, our sheen has gone off. And I'm just going to take a little bit of water and put it into the colors that I've been using to make lighter stuff because I'm gonna paint these sorts of things on the, the more distant ranges there, but I don't want them to be as dark as the ones here in the foreground. So, same colors, just a little bit more water and yet more water as I go back. Now, oh, how about, let's just have one more thing like that down there. Here's a, that's my driveway this morning. You can see it looks like a little mountain range. <laughs> so the lighter areas, I, they're really dark here, I guess. You can see really dark where the light switches. And then it gets a little lighter back here. So the whites, just to give us a sense of uh, light coming in mostly from the left, I'm going to just put a maybe some turquoise and some of what I've already been using. I'm gonna make a glaze and I'm gonna keep it within those planes that we identified earlier. A uh, little bit behind here. So the edges will soften on one side and I'm hoping to get a look of uh, some variation in the snow uh, with the amounts of light that are getting to it. Lower down, we should be getting a little bit less light and uh, more to the right side, we'll be getting a bit less light. So I uh, would probably even go a tad bit darker, particularly back on this side. And when you do this, you also want to hit the places you painted dark because you don't want to upset the relationship that you created earlier. You want to maintain that. Like I say, you get a lot of playroom here because the amount of snow is going to vary one week to the next. I want to make sure my horizon is pretty straight. Doesn't it? 
We don't have to be oceanically straight. This is a mountain range, so there's gonna be a bit of uh, undulation, but uh, even though from this distance, you could likely see some curvature of the earth, uh, it, it just doesn't uh, look right in paintings for some reason. So, oh golly, I'm gonna, gonna have some fun here. I have a color called lavender that I like to use. It looks basically like this color. That's a Holbein color, I, although I do believe other people make it. It's, um, in this instance, it's an ultramarine blue, ultramarine violet, and titanium white. So it has a nice body, and it's, it's a bang-on color for snow and shadow. It's just... Might even put a little bit of it down here to... Those whites down there below there, they shouldn't be white white. They should be bluish. Could even throw in a bit of yellow ochre here. That sounds seems like a weird color, but I want to get a bit of that granite or earth or whatever. Now, okay. I think I'll peel and, and see where it goes. If that tells me anything, maybe. We'll see. There's still a lot of glisten down in this area. So if I were to work on it, I would want to use thicker paint. Oh, hey, maybe you can see here, uh, there's a kind of a blossom happening because that area was still pretty wet and when I put the yellow ochre in, it sort of pushed some of the blue out of the way. So you could actually even do lifts at this point. Um, okay. Let's see, where else? Well, I'm going to leave my UFO alone. It's just up there. We can't do anything about that. Now, let's put some So anything we do down here where there's still a damp surface, we're going to want to use thick paint. Um, that means uh, very slow moving. So I'm going to go back to that mixture of ultramarine blue and my cad red to get a deep purple. I am going to crisp up this edge back here. That's something of the, uh, what do you call it, the main crater or, so that's going to be somewhat distinct. Uh, now here I might want a, uh, so, much softer edge. So I haven't put that in. I blotted the brush and I'm just bringing a little water to the right edge, right side edge, which is the right edge in this instance. <laughs> uh, here it's wet, so this thicker paint is going to kind of jump in there and soften a bit. 
I do want a more distinct edge right along here. To, there, I guess it's a pretty distinct ridge there, and it looks like I've lost it a bit, so I'm going to get some white. And straight out of the tube, and just recover that. And the way to do that is squeeze it to the top, Stick your brush right in there. That's just Chinese way. Yeah. Crisp that up. Crisp that up. Maybe I'll put a little bit of brain ear back. Mount St. Helens. Yeah, there's a nice little bit up here that I... He says, would you consider yourself an impressionistic painter? Um, that's, you know, a good question. I, impressionism is very, very misunderstood. Um, there's a... Uh, Impressionism is technically French and mainly Monet. Um, short strokes, um, does it form not important? Well, I don't want to say that. Um, the color effects, the effect of the light is very important to an impressionist. That's important to me. Uh, short strokes uh, built up. Not quite to pointillism, but um, I like to use let the water do the work in watercolors. So I, I'm more of a long stroke painter, uh, even in oils. Um, I do like the specificity of the form. That's kind of an American thing. Uh, we like to not dissolve the thing too much. Um, if you look at, say, Monet's Rouen Cathedral series, the form is very, very identifiable, but he's really broken it up. If you were to come up on a, on a building and it looked like that in life, you would think, boy, it must have been a, a meteorite attack or something. <laughs> Uh, or I get, uh, maybe sandblasting or something that really broke up the surface, which, have, if that had been done, um, the effect of the light on the surface would be all that more obvious and, and enhanced. Um, so I like the lighting that Impressionists use. I like a little bit more specificity of the form. And uh, I'm probably more in the line of the American Impressionists. Um, but that's a, it's an interesting question because what is an Impressionism? All painting is Impressionism to some extent. You're even abstract. You're trying to render an impression uh, of a thought you had or I don't know. Here I'm gonna just take maybe a lift a little bit of that paint to get a light spot. I could soften this with a damp brush. I might even put a little, 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 little bit more of that sort of thing. And then I'm gonna call it quits um, and look at it. So the idea here today my painting doesn't look as distant as the photo. Yeah, it could be softer back here, couldn't it? 
Um, and I have brought this, I really do want to feature <laughs> what we've got here. Uh, you know, the, the best way to have gotten, does this one look a little more distant? This was the sketchbook version. Bit more distant. Yeah. Um, now, what I did here is I did not leave any white at all for the last two mountains, uh, Adams and Rainier. I just used the yellow ochre and I put a little bit of blue. See if we can get closer. I just used a little bit of blue to divine the darker parts of it. Um, that I left white. This I left white. That I left yellow. So let's see what happens if we tint. <laughs> that might make it look a little more distant. So. But again, we have a lot of leeway on this. The amount of light that is hitting those objects or the amount of snow that's there and kicking stuff around or bouncing light around that would that would create a different effect so you can you have a lot of leeway with a subject like this um, so to review um, dry paper whatever you put on it is going to stay exactly the way you painted it there's a lot of water on top, like you just initially applied a, a, a wash, and then you put another color on top of it. It's going to dissolve very, very, and, and travel quite far. When some of it's soaked in and some of it is still on top, it'll still do the same thing, but not as much. Hopefully you can see this traveled a little further than that. Um, once the water is soaked in, if you put runny paint on top, it's still going to connect with the water beneath. You're going to get a soft edge, but it could kick some of the existing paint, which is not yet dry, out of the way. So, as you can see, the form with a stiffer paint will be... It'll maintain its form, but it... it Depending on how much water is there, the edge will soften to a greater or lesser degree. So hopefully um, that helps. An American Impressionist I admire. Well, uh, Sargent would certainly fall into that category. Um, gosh, there's a couple guys from Indiana and I can't remember their names right now. <laughs> Uh, How about Daniel Garber? Garber, but he was a Pennsylvania one. Uh, 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 William Merritt Chase is, 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 would be in that category. Uh, there was a guy that hung out with Sargent. Uh, the famous painting of... the Sargent did a painting of that guy painting and his wife in a red dress looking really bored. Um, Glackens? Uh, not Glackens. I'm terrible with the names. You know, I, I can picture the pictures, but <laughs> so uh, read. Uh, uh, That's great. Uh, last name is Reed. R E I D, uh, and I can't remember his first name. But oh, geez. Anyway, uh, there it is. Uh, different consistencies of paint into different conditions of paper give us different effects. And we plan that uh, generally light to dark, big to small, soft edge to harder edge, and the softer edge and the harder edge is, is to a large extent painting on a wetter or a drier surface. Uh, depending on what you want. So, hope you guys... No, not Charles Reed. <laughs> He's, he just recently died, actually. 
Um, but he would be a, a, a modern painter. Um, whew. Maybe I'll, I'll, if when I think of these guys, I'll post them later. <laughs> so thanks, uh, everybody, for tuning in. And uh, what I would like to do maybe next week is this uh, scene from England with a classic Thames barge. Well, it's not a Thames barge. I think this is in Suffolk near a place called Pin Mill. But there, it's just wonderful shapes, and it's, it'll use a bit of what we used here in a more classic uh, watercolor setting. So um, thank you for tuning in, and hope everybody enjoyed that. Bye-bye. <laughs>